One of the most difficult choices to make as a Star Citizen backer often is which ship is going to be my big ship, the big boy, the bad boy, the ship that is going to kind of set the high water mark of where I intend to go. Some people look at it and they see the ships that are being built in the game and they see the ships that they own and say, I'm going to own my, you know, uh, own, I'm going to earn my way to that ship. Other people, we see it, it's on sale. And, you know, over the years we've accumulated um, ships. We, we were very much, a lot of us in the beginning were very much hype buyers. Um, oh, it's a new ship. Oh, that looks cool. I got to get it. I can, I can see myself using that. But as the collection grew, the desire to downsize came in. And then some very interesting big ships, military ships, came into Star Citizen. And quite a few of us looked at them and said, ordinarily, for you know the price tag, I kind of wouldn't go for that. But the, if I consolidate out of all these things that really now I'm not really sure that I want to fly, I can actually buy that without really buying it because the money that I'd be spending on it is money that I've already spent. For me, that ship is, of course, the Nautilus. No, talk about the merchantmen. What are you doing? Shut up. We're getting there going on a journey together we're getting there now the nautilus of course is the mine layer and <laughs> being able to ambush somebody with mines kind of appealing to someone like me but one of the other big selling points was of course those big old size seven guns on the front i like i like those guns and so i saw some very interesting possibilities with these ships or with this ship and so, you know, at one point, every ship that I had bought in the game was actually in the game. And I kind of, this and the Polaris kind of pushed me out and the Polaris ended up actually becoming this. Um, just because of my specific circumstances, wanting to play as a bit of a scoundrel in Star Citizen. And so... I was kind of looking forward to it. And remember, this is the guy that just last week was saying, I don't like the idea of there only being one entrance into Pyro. And yes, I did see the part about the Swiss cheese metaphor. It's going to be very interesting to see how that develops. I'm very excited about that. But, you know, this is the guy who could have been laying mines technically at the entrance to the system, though I doubt CIG would allow you to actually do that. But, you know, when some people assume that I was, you know, I was just doing this to encourage people to go there so I could pirate them. No, I'm I'm arguing for you. I'm not arguing for me when I say these things. But the Nautilus, I've been very secure in that choice. Until I saw the new Banu Merchantman. Or rather, more specifically... The big old size eight guns on the new man on the new brand new merchantman. Nice, nice, nice. Now, I'm going to be using a lot of the older images of the brand new merchantman. Just producing this many videos inside of the space of one week is a little bit, a little bit time consuming. So, we're going to be you know kind of going with the older imagery and kind of talking about some of the ideas behind the new merchantman. But when I saw those size eight guns, I, I started to think, and it's like, oh, the IAE is, uh, what, like a month away. That could be interesting. That could be interesting. But ultimately I kind of went back to the Nautilus and I just said, eh, if I'm going to get a big ship, and a military ship, you know, I want a military ship. I want a dedicated military vessel. Something that is going to come with military components and armor and all of these things. It's not to say that the merchantman isn't going to be a resilient ship or isn't going to be a good ship. But for me, the big ship, I wanted it to basically have that UEE stamp of approval on it. And the Nautilus does. And 
I mean, it's a mind layer. The possibilities are very intriguing with a ship like that. Now, the Banu Merchantman, you know, one of the other things that kind of pushed me away from it is the idea that it is a truly colossal ship. It is a big ship, so much so that even at the existing landing points, it's still going to have to have folding wings to accommodate it. But one of the other things that the Banu Merchantman was going to have to accommodate since the arrival of the Banu Defender is the Banu Defender. And we were wondering how this was going to work. And we've been wondering this for a long time because CIG had hinted at this heavily when they sold the Banu Defender. They were talking about in a quote unquote interaction between both ships. And of course the Defender is meant to follow the merchantman on its travels and defend it. And so images like this have been produced by the community where the defenders are mounted like missiles hanging under the wings of a modern day, uh, what, fourth generation, fifth generation, fourth generation uh, fighter and some of the earlier ones. But, you know, obviously it was not going to be this. I do have to be honest that while I did like the idea of the dorsal hanger, not unlike the 890 jump, though mounted a little bit more midway in the ship, it, it felt a little limited. I was kind of hoping that they were going to do something where you could stack two defenders, one on top of the other, and so you could eject two ships out of there instead of just one. I, I still kind of feel that it, it should almost be, you know, just the two ships, but almost like a Pez dispenser. For those of you who know that, what that is, just something that you can click a couple of ships out and they're held right together in uh, within that confi confined space. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to make it real. I know that. But I, I kind of feel like a singular defender is a little under shooting the mark. Um, but once again, time will tell. But I was very glad that it was included, that that wasn't just hot air and it wasn't just something that it, <laughs> like the Buccaneers cargo bay or the Buccaneers uh, gun racks. That wasn't just a, a talking point to sell the ship and then turn around and say, oh, well, turns out we can't do it. It's it. You know, it's funny how how things change. You know, it's very funny. But. I was glad to see that made it into the ship. And obviously there's going to be some defender pilots and some merchantman pilots who bought the original merchantman way back in the day who are now very happy that they have it or at least still have it on buyback. And that kind of brings us to the tremendous weight for the Banu merchantman. And it, you know, we've had a couple of hints here and there, some concept images that kind of gave the impression that the ship was currently being worked on, even though the work had technically been abandoned to be revisited later, of course, um, at the point that those images were shown. And it kind of, you know, CIG had their version of it. It was, we're just kind of showing you that we're still touching on it from time to time. And some of the, you know, some of the backers were very displeased because they felt that CIG was just kind of showing these just to sell more Banu Merchantmans and realistically they weren't working on the ship. So, I mean, it, it's been a troubled ship. Now, at one point there was a false start. Um, I believe it was Sandy and Ben on an episode of across the verse or around the verse way back in the day. I think about September 2015, I believe is when it happened. They announced that um, the, the Drake Caterpillar, the Xeon Scout, or sorry, the Xerox Scout, and the um, Banu Merchantman were all going to be going into production between now and early 2016. I believe that is when that happened. And everyone got really excited. And of course, the Caterpillar showed up, the Xerox Scout showed up. But 
the Bandu Merchantman didn't. And it's been a, a long, long wait for the owners and the fans of that ship. And that's, it's one of the things that really doesn't do the ships or CIG or the backers any favor is when there isn't like a definite delivery date on these things. Because, you know, I've seen a lot of people are super excited about the Liberator. And as long as you stay in your lane, I think it's a, a great ship. But remember that when you buy something like that and it doesn't have a date, at least none that I've seen so far, and I've been kind of looking for it, you enter into the realm of the Nautilus, of the Polaris, you know, and you're all at the back of the bus and everyone seems to be going before you do. It's like, really? That ship? You're putting in that ship, but not my ship? What? <laughs> so to see this finally come to fruition after so long is it's awesome. And I mean, there <laughs> obviously there is a little bit of a uh, <laughs> Obviously, there is a little bit of a fan base, but you won't see the same reaction when they talk about the Crusader Starliner Genesis, whatever, the passenger jet <laughs> ship. People would be like, oh, yeah, that thing. You know, for, and but, you know, the three or four people who still own it are going to be happy. The rest of us will be like, what? That thing? Why? But bringing it back to the Merchantman, Certainly over the years, there's been a lot of fan-produced images uh, detailing how the interior was going to work. Some, in, in some ways, reasonable, in other ways, <laughs> a, little, uh, a little optimistic or a little unrealistic. But to finally see the interiors as CIG showed them off, they, they do look amazing. Uh, even just the entry, the walkway up into the ship where things can be advertised. All of that sounded fantastic and looked great. Or rather looked great, but while at first, well, the first time you hear it, it all sounds great. It, it does raise a lot of questions with the marketplace specifically in the ship. And that is going to be a very interesting one to see how that you know pans out. Because the idea is, is you're going to bring this ship to a place and you're going to have a market full of all the things that you're selling. And people are just going to be like, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a fire sale. Except it's not a fire sale. It's a regular sale. You're a, a mobile marketer trying to sell goods in certain areas you know, obviously the areas where these goods are much less likely to be found or maybe pricing it under what they would normally cost in that area because you went all the way to the source and brought it all the way here certainly you're gonna have enough space and uh, cargo space to facilitate that and it all sounds fantastic it really really does but then reality kind of kicks in. So the idea is, is that you arrive at a location, people are waiting, they just can't wait to get up on your ship and uh, buy goods, but is that really a realistic expectation? You know, that as you're landing your ship, all these other ships are following They're Oh, I can't wait to shop on the Merchantman. A lot of players might idealize that as being realistic, but the truth of it is, is that it may very well not be that. Players in video games, especially MMOs, are creatures of habit. I know where to go and get my thing. I am going to go to that place and get that thing. And even if I know it's a few UEC cheaper over here or a couple of UEC cheaper over there, I know my place and so I like to go to my spot. And another thing is, is that the people who play MMOs often tend to enjoy kind of doing things on their own. And you see that in so many MMOs where players could easily trade in between, in between each other for resources, for professions in a lot of MMOs 
oftentimes the better solution where you know the amount of professions you can have are limited is to create multiple characters one for each of the complementary professions and then just go get the things yourself and so it could very well be that a player who has that capability is probably just going to go and get the cargo themselves wherever they want it chances are that cig is probably going to have to step in and make it so that npcs are carrying money and what happens is when you land at some of these settlements like they showed us uh, at pyro you know when they were showing the mission and the different ways that you can complete the mission chances are how this is going to work in the game is going to be much more that npcs are going to have a fixed amount of money on them that they can spend at any given player shop and when you bring the ship to a location like that lower the ramp say hey come up and shop in my ship they'll be shopping for you know some guns grenades bullets whatever maybe some knickknacks for their house certain resources that they may want for their local businesses things like that but it is going to have some kind of a limitation on them but at the same some type of financial cap like you just can't sit there and say oh this little this little community that more or less lives in squalor in some forgotten corner of an abandoned star system is going to buy, you know, 100 million UEC worth of goods off of your ship. It's just not going to happen. But what it'll probably do is it'll very much deliver on the promise of being the flying merchant. And so for those players, they're going to very much get the emotional experience that they want out of the ship. And sometimes that's just as important as actual in-game performance. And that's something that when we talk about ships, it's one thing to say, oh, this ship puts out this much DPS versus this ship puts out that much DPS. But there is a certain amount of emotional fulfillment that players seek that those those factors become a little bit secondary to a lot of players. Or you'll find players who are just so headstrong about the ships that they choose. They're like, I will find a way to make that work, you know? And so I think that overall, because I've seen mechanics like that in games before, that that is very much how the the, the uh, marketplace of the merchantman is going to work in the end. It's ultimately going to be NPCs shopping on your ship. Very much from that point of view, the Banu merchantman does deliver on what the emotional experience, I believe, of the Banu merchantman owner, what they are seeking out of this ship that it is going to deliver that apart from that seeing the weapons and the hangar everything that they showed us this is looking like the pinnacle trade ship and i know some people say well actually no it's the it's the whole d or the whole e those are the pinnacle no 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 those ships are freaking boring this this is impressive this is this is kind of like an idealization and actual reality meshing from what i've seen almost perfectly if i was to be a trader in star citizen i don't necessarily want the hull e or the hull d or even the whole scene. Well, I don't really want any of them. But this is a ship that I would fly. This is something interesting. As a as a pirate ship, it would present some interesting possibilities, but once again, the size does kind of turn me off a little. And that's one thing to say that when I'm also, you know, when I also own a pirate caterpillar who knows but <laughs> um this this to me really feels like while it's not numerically the apex predator in the in the trading ship field it really does feel like the king of the road to me on an emotional level and i have to i have to say the size eight guns, that's that's formidable, dude. That is formidable. 
just taking the even taking the fighter out of the equation that represents a very daunting target i have to admit and i think that's also one of the things that makes it the pinnacle at least in my eyes so it's been a long wait but i think that cig is making it worth the wait and with that that is the old new Benu merchantman hope you enjoyed the show thanks for watching Thank you, thank, you, thank you for watching. So, 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 so if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow, please follow, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.